Hello, and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual program series. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the Foundation. We are the nonprofit partner to the National Archives. Greetings from Washington, D.C. Through this foundation programming, we're pleased to open the virtual doors of the National Archives and share the holdings, more than 15 billion records, objects, films, letters, drawings, photographs, and most importantly, stories from our nation's past. We've got a terrific program for you today, but I'd love to know where you're viewing from. So please use the YouTube chat next to the video and put your hometown in state. It's always great to see the towns from our national audience. As a note, because of the scheduling with our speakers, this program has been pre-recorded. To start our program, I'm happy to introduce Governor Jim Blanchard. He's the former governor of Michigan, former member of Congress, and a former ambassador to Canada. And most notably, he is the chair and president of the National Archives Foundation. He has some welcoming remarks and we'll introduce our moderator. Please welcome Governor Jim Blanchard. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and welcome all of you, one and all, to this celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Congressional Black Caucus. I happen to be privileged to be chair of the National Archives Foundation and we're proud of our role in working with the caucus. But more importantly, uh, from my point of view, I served as a member of Congress many years ago with 12 of the 13 original members of the Congressional Black Caucus and the widow of the 13. And it was quite an outstanding group, a very diverse group. We had everyone from Shirley Chisholm, who was the first woman to run for president, uh, a distinguished member from New York in her own right, to Ralph Metcalf, who was a silver winner, silver medal winner uh, at the Berlin 1936 Olympics, running very close to second to Jesse Owens. I might also add that Ralph had held the world record in sprinting for a number of years before that. He went on, by the way, to be a political science teacher and a distinguished member of Congress. There were people like uh, Perrin Mitchell, a leader in civil rights, who I know I worked with him on the banking committee and he helped us with the Chrysler rescue oh, way back then. Then there was my friend, John Conyers, who was always a leader of civil rights and rose to be chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Many of the leaders of the original 13 were chairs of committees and led with distinction. One of the original founders was Charles Diggs of Michigan, Charles Charles Diggs Jr., who was actually a mentor to me. And he helped form an earlier group uh, of black caucus members before the formalization of the original Black Caucus in 1971. And Charles Diggs was a leader in DC Home Rule, District of Columbia Home Rule, also a leader in anti-apartheid in South Africa. He was chair of the African Subcommittee on Foreign Affairs and also chair of the District of Columbia Committee. All in all, it was quite a wide and diverse group. Uh, they serve with great distinction. You're gonna hear, hear all about them. Uh, in this program, we're just happy to have it. And I'm, I'm happy to have as my vice chair, Secretary Rodney Slater. Uh, Rodney Slater from Arkansas uh, was not only United States Secretary of Transportation, but he was also previously then administrator of the Federal Highway Administration. For many years, and I was privileged to, privileged to work with him, he was a special advisor to President Bill Clinton He's currently a partner in the law firm of Squire Patton Boggs. He was previously also an assistant attorney general in Arkansas. He's one of the co-owners, I uh, might add, of the Washington Nationals baseball team. And we're so proud to have him serving in the archives and to being today's moderator and guest host. So I turn it over to you, Secretary Slater, and thanks. Thank you, uh, Governor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your wonderful leadership of the National Archives Foundation. And thank you for your distinguished service over the years. And especially thank you for kicking off our program and uh, sharing with us some of your experiences, personal experiences with some of the early members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, we are delighted today to hear from uh, the majority whip uh, who we'll hear from in just a moment. We'll have a series of uh, question and answers and uh, really 
enjoy the benefit of his um, rich uh, background and history, uh, not only as a history professor, but as a distinguished member of uh, Congress and a leader of the Congressional Black Caucus and the entire Congress as well. Uh, we also uh, very much appreciate uh, the uh, clip that um, we're going to hear uh, from the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Chairwoman uh, Joyce Beatty. Uh, and uh, we very much uh, appreciate her participation in the program as well. Good afternoon. I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and representative for Ohio's third congressional district. On behalf of the 57 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, I would like to begin by congratulating the National Archives Foundation on your virtual programming recording our history and to thank you for highlighting the Congressional Black Caucus as we celebrate our 50th anniversary. I am always pleased to join my colleague and leader, the Majority Whip and third ranking Democrat in the United States House of Representatives, Congress James Clyburn. And I also want to extend a warm thank you to the esteemed event participants, Governor James Blanchard and my good friend, former U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Rodney Slater. In 1971, 13 Black members of Congress, 12 men, and one phenomenal woman, Shirley Chisholm, founded what would become one of the most consequential legislative bodies in our nation's history. Known as the Congressional Black Caucus, the conscience of the Congress. The Congressional Black Caucus is now the largest legislative caucus in Congress. We are critical to the passage of any legislation in the House, and we use that power to ensure that the interests of Black people and our communities are strongly represented. The Congressional Black Caucus members continue to be on the front lines, just as 50 years ago when then President Nixon refused to meet with them, they went public with their fight and boycotted the 1971 State of the Union Address. And still today, we are fighting for equality of results for racial justice, voting rights, a comprehensive justice and policing bill, child tax credits, equality, housing, education, jobs and financial parity for our communities. The Congressional Black Caucus wrote and championed the passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Bill in the House, and we continue to advocate for its passage in the Senate. The Congressional Black Caucus works hand in hand with the Biden-Harris administration to support legislation aimed at closing the racial wealth gap. We believe in building back better by supporting small businesses and investing in the infrastructure that creates and secures jobs and opportunities for Black people. We are the leading voice behind voting rights. H.R. 4, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Bill. We played a major role in the passage of the American Rescue Plan. And yes, the CBC has a rich history in spearheading, passing legislation, and fighting for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Reparations, breaking the cycle of violence act, and making Martin Luther King Day and Juneteenth national holidays. Currently, the Congressional Black Caucus counts among its membership and legacy six full committee chairs, more than 25 subcommittee chairs, 26 Black women, the 44th President of the United States, and the current Vice President and first Black woman to serve in that office as well as numerous cabinet members, senior administration officials, advisors to the president and agency heads. So let us not forget, we are the stories of hope, perseverance, success, and attainment. And this is our message, our power, the Congressional Black Caucus. The majority whip uh, is someone that we know uh, very, very well. 
Uh, he's been a member of Congress since 1993. He represents the sixth congressional district in South Carolina. Uh, he's a distinguished uh, author and uh, just a renowned public servant. And uh, Majority Whip Clyburn, we are so very, very pleased that uh, you're with us today. And uh, you've heard some of the opening uh, comments uh, from Governor Blanchard about his experiences as a member of Congress uh, with uh, many of the early members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, we know that it was an organization founded in uh, 1971 and that we're now uh, honored to recognize its 50th anniversary. Uh, before we talk about maybe some of the current activities of the Congressional Black Caucus, let's go back uh, a bit more uh, and talk just a little bit about the challenges that they might have uh, faced uh, when there was just 13 and they were getting started and, and, and needed to form this group to give themselves support, frankly, one to another, uh, and then to do battle with uh, an environment that was uh, somewhat different than it is now, but still quite, uh, quite challenging. What are some of your memories as you reflect on how the organization got started, why it was necessary for there to be such an organization? And frankly, does that need still uh, exist maybe? Well, thank you very, very much for having me and to, to be here with Governor Blanchard, who I have uh, uh, watched over the years, remember when he was in, when he was in Congress and, of course, uh, as governor uh, up in Michigan. And thanks to you for your tremendous service. Uh, having met you when uh, you were uh, still uh, eking out a living down in Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> look true. at uh, what you've become. Uh, one of my favorite people. Thank you so much. You know, um, I would ask people to think about 19, uh, the 68 campaign. Uh, Richard Nixon running for president of the United States. And if you recall, uh, Richard Nixon uh, developed something he called the Southern Strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a, a code or code words. Uh, I think we all know uh, with all of that meant. And of course, uh, that is the kind of, uh, he won that election. Uh, and of course, uh, members of Congress who looked like me were concerned uh, as to exactly uh, where he would be taking the country. Uh, and as members of Congress, uh, they saw it as their duty uh, to seek uh, an audience with and sit down and see whether or not there were things that they could talk about uh, in order to uh, chart uh, the way forward. You know, we've been in pursuit of perfection in this country for a long time, especially in the preamble to the Constitution. In order to form a more perfect union, a recognition that the union is not perfect. And we know uh, what happened uh, in, uh, say, Chicago, 1964, uh, that, um, uh, Democratic Convention, and they read down in 1968 a presidential election, and the person who won seemed not to have the kind of sensitivities that they uh, wanted to see in a president, and they sought an audience and were refused. Hmm. Uh, that told them then there was time not to go their individual ways, uh, but to have a collective approach a coordinated approach uh, to trying to uh, get the president of the United States to respond, respond to the dreams and aspirations of people of color. Uh, now, you said times are different now. Yes, they are different. But the more things change, the more th they say the same. Yes. Are, the experience in some today of what we saw back then. We yes. just came out of a four year, four years of a presidency mm -hmm. that told us at the time uh, that we needed to have a coordinated approach, uh, which is what we were doing uh, last year. Yes. When he changed the direction of the country. And um, 
Mr. Whip, um, uh, clearly, as you noted, um, we've come a long way from even the number of members, 13 then and now 57, a record. Uh, but even when they were said, uh, and when they received the word no from uh, President Nixon, uh, I think it's uh, important to um, uh, just touch on that a little bit more. They didn't just step back and go away. Not only did they organize, but I think he had a special event where he was um, speaking where they may have had a little something to say as well. <laughs> well, it's called the State of the Union. Uh, that's one of the reasons I, I didn't want to get <laughs> too more bogged down in the history of it, but they boycotted uh, his State of the Union address. It got everybody's attention. Uh, we saw something similar happen, uh, what, three, four years ago? Uh, yeah. uh, when the members of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, boycotted the State of the Union. It was not a total boycott. Uh, some of us in leadership did attend, uh, but a lot of members did not. Uh, in order to show uh, that they were not going to uh, just take it, that they were going to respond as, as best they could. Uh, and of course, I was with um, our chair of the Congressional Black Caucus at the time, who is now a, a special assistant uh, to the President of the United States, Cedric Richmond, uh, when he had his meeting mm -hmm. uh, with um, uh, President, the 45th President of the United States. Uh, I was in the room with him that day, and I can tell you um, of what uh, the 45 thought would be uh, uh, press the veil, uh, or a photo op. No, uh, it got to be much more than that, thanks to uh, the creative and innovative leadership uh, of um, uh, Cedric. And so I can just imagine uh, what they went through. Diggs uh, mm -hmm. and, and Clay and all of those who were a part of that original group uh, mm -hmm. in trying to get the attention uh, of, um, uh, of Richard Nixon, and, and we now know from history why uh, they needed to do what they were doing. And mo if more people had listened to them, he would not have been reelected in 1972. So we aren't going to take that chance. We yes. learned from what they did to make sure that we did not get a reelection uh, of, of 45. <laughs> well, let's. Uh... Let's maybe talk about that uh, a little bit, uh, but in this way, um, you know, I think uh, when you mentioned 68, I thought about the major losses that we had with, um, uh, with Dr. King and then Robert Kennedy, as you know, and how it shook us really to the core when you think about um, the voices of freedom and the promoters of democracy being, um, slain in that way and, and, and efforts to silence the, uh, the dreamer and, and to do away with the dream to some degree, but those dreams were able to be sustained by, by others, yourself included. Uh, let, me, let me just ask, moving from 13 to 57, how does that change things when you think about you know, the power of the Congressional uh, Black Caucus. And you, you mentioned uh, Cedric Richmond, uh, now on the White House staff, uh, 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 Congresswoman, former uh, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, now in the cabinet. I mean, I think that's a powerful testimony about uh, the, uh, the, the enduring power of the caucus. And, and let us not uh, forget <laughs> the Vice President, Kamala Harris, who's now uh, as I noted, the vice president, but the members themselves and working with this administration, uh, how, how do you see the significance of this moment and what are some of the things that we might look forward to? Well, you know, um, a lot of people may not see it this way, but remember, uh, Barack Obama was a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. That's exactly right. right. He and I yeah. used to sit next to each other uh, at meetings, you know, uh, the Senate uh, see themselves as a little bit uh, uh, different from the House, so they didn't come to every meeting. Uh, most of us in the House 
uh, we get to every meeting because I was actually just going to touch oh. on that, Mr. Uh, <laughs> but go on. Yeah, you know, but uh, there they, they participated, and I can tell you, I sincerely believe that they learn a lot in those meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're from Illinois and the United States Senator, uh, sitting down in that meeting, listening to Ben Thompson from Mississippi, yes, uh, listening to uh, those members, John Lewis from Georgia, yes. uh, you will get a much better feel for what it is that you're up against. I know that Kamala has told me more than once uh, how much she's learned being from California Sitting mm -hmm. down in the meeting at the Congressional Black Caucus uh, is pretty good preparation uh, for how to uh, uh, conduct yourself when you go out. So I think the Congressional Black Caucus has played a much uh, bigger role in all of this than people think. Mm -hmm. Now, we've gone from 13 to 57. Yes. What does that mean? That means that we've got people in the caucus now like Emmanuel Cleaver, where I just came from, I was out with Emmanuel uh, in Kansas City uh, at the um, uh, Truman uh, Foundation's um, uh, annual dinner. Uh, Emmanuel Cleaver uh, comes from a congressional district that's not even close uh, to being uh, an African American district. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got uh, several members of the Congressional Black Caucus now who represent districts. Uh, that are less than 5% African-American. That means then that you're getting uh, not just uh, a Black thought, you're getting a diversity of philosophy, a diversity of experiences. You're getting diversity far beyond uh, what you would ordinarily think. Uh, it broadens your interpretation of what demographics really mean. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people will put it on race and gender, but it's a much bigger issue now. So when you got 57 members, yes, uh, like we now have, it means that you have to broaden uh, and be much more encompassing uh, what your agenda is all about. And that's why you see such hard work uh, being done by Sir George Beatty, uh, who talks about uh, our power, uh, our message, uh, and to emphasize our. Yes, yes. And, you know, um, uh, Mr. Whip, I, I don't know that most people would, would, would really know that. I think that there is the assumption by most onlookers to believe that uh, the caucus members represent predominantly Black uh, areas, whether they be rural or urban or suburban. And your points uh, in that regard, very, very uh, significant, I believe. And I'm so pleased that you mentioned um, former President Barack Obama, because uh, I'm sure, as you noted, that he picked up uh, insights and uh, information that um, was helpful to him after becoming president and putting forth the vision for an Affordable uh, Care Act. And it's, it's great to salute the action on the part of the Supreme Court just last week, uh, allowing us to keep in place this very, very important um, uh, lifeline for so many, especially coming through this COVID uh, period. I know that you were a champion of the Affordable Care Act and you worked closely with uh, the speaker and the president uh, in that regard. Anything else that you'd like to just share in that regard? Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned the Affordable Care Act because I think that is the best example uh, of getting uh, various points of view uh, brought into the discussion. Because you remember very well uh, that because of the nature of things, uh, Barack Obama had run on doing something that had not been done uh, in the over 100 years that it had been introduced. It was Theodore Roosevelt, not Franklin, Theodore Roosevelt, the Republican, who introduced universal access uh, to health care uh, over 100 years before Barack Obama, uh, Barack Obama got elected. He ran on that, and he set out uh, to put it in the law and was advised 
by a lot of people. Don't go there. Yes. Uh, leave that alone. Uh, let's save that for later. But Nancy Pelosi, uh, because of the input she was getting from the Congressional Black Caucus members there, uh, she advised him, yes, you got to go there. Mm -hmm. And she knew she was on solid ground because the members of the Congressional Black Caucus were all sitting there in her caucus <laughs> every day. Uh, we saw health care, as I said, on, on the floor of the House, uh, as the Civil Rights Act of the 21st century, because we were outlawing discrimination based upon health. Uh, this, people were discriminated against uh, once they got sick. Uh, and we saw that uh, as being something we needed to tackle. Uh, and we think we lost. I think I would agree uh, that we lost the House uh, because uh, of passing uh, the Affordable Care Act. However, we ran on it eight, what, what, eight years later or yes. to whatever yes. the time yes. was yes. and won. Exactly. Be and because people finally decide, what, they found out what Barack Obama envisioned. They saw what they had. Uh, they didn't know, and we didn't do a good job of telling them exactly what they had. I can go through four or five parts of the Affordable Care Act that people did not know they had. The one that I always talk about was um, uh, we had in the Affordable Care Act that insurance companies had to return the, to their policyholders 80% uh, of the premiums in the form of benefits. And if they didn't do that, when the audits came, they had to re, uh, refund that excess money to them. Uh, and uh, a lot of people got checks from the insurance companies and thought it was the benevolence of the insurance companies. They didn't know that it was Obamacare. Exactly. They exactly. said, you get your money back if you pay in it, and they have not sufficiently uh, rewarded you with, with, uh, with benefits. So I could go through other aspects of it. People finally found out. Yes. And when they found out, they put us back in charge. Yes. Mr. Whip, I, I must say that uh, I noticed you, you said uh, Obamacare. Uh, I'm sure you probably saw experiences where people would be interviewed and the uh, interviewer would say, well, what do you think about Obamacare? Well, I, I don't like that. Well, what about the Affordable Care Act? Oh, I love that, which is well, very- what you did down in Arkansas. Arkansas <laughs> came to oh, something else. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say Arkansas, but, <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> oh, but I'm saying Arkansas did that. Uh, 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 Kentucky, <laughs> Connect, they, had, they just put another name on it. And yes. people loved it. So that they would love it. That's an excellent <laughs> point. <laughs> well, look, let me ask this. There's another label that's been given to the um, uh, Congressional Black Caucus as the, the conscience of the Congress. Uh, tell me a little bit about how you think about that, um, that phraseology, that, uh, that, uh, that um, label, if you will. And maybe some of the particular values that come to mind when you uh, are really being the conscience of the Congress and promoting uh, matters pertaining to civil rights or housing or healthcare or whatever. Um, but just that, that, that title, I think, is very, very important. You know, if you just think about the word conscious and what, and, and what reflects that, I think that one of the things or well, at least what I think about, mm -hmm. is our pledge, mm -hmm. the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice mm -hmm. for all. That's a conscious statement of what mm -hmm. the country is all about. Mm -hmm. And the Congressional Black Caucus has committed itself to the fulfillment of that conscious statement. Mm -hmm. So when we refer to ourselves as the conscious uh, of the country, you're actually saying we are trying to keep the country in close 
touched with his vision statement. Mm -hmm. Liberty and justice for all. In fact, I picked that up and I use as my mantra for, for everything that I do, making this country's greatness accessible and affordable for all. That's a conscious statement of mine that mm -hmm. I have lifted from that pledge. So that's what it means to me when people say the conscious uh, of the Congress, we are looking at the vision. That you know, a lot of people know that that pledge really did not become official until the 1940s. We didn't always have that pledge. This country took the statement and said, and I remember it was in the 19, I guess it's the 1950s. Uh, yeah, uh, when we put the words under God in it. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. when it happened. In fact, I had to repeat the pledge many times uh, in order to remember. Uh, that you have to put under yeah, God. Yeah. And so that's the conscious statement for the for all of us. Yes. And so yes. we in the caucus, we work every day to try to get us to live up, especially to the last phrase, liberty and justice for all. For all. Uh, Congressman, I... I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't just acknowledge again how you use your knowledge of history and as a history professor to really champion um, all of the things that make us the nation that we are and the nation that we aspire to be. I mean, even your use of the words earlier, more perfect union, it's this quest, this journey that we're on and this ability to amend. You've mentioned de Tocqueville many, many times and talking yeah. about, yes, and how he talked about that. Uh, let me just, what is it? I mean, and, and by the way, when you, when you make these comments and use the phrases, I don't just hear you uttering the words. I see you personifying, I think, the spirit that the words represent. To me, that is very, very powerful. And it goes to this issue of the conscience, you know, reminding yeah. us every day that we need to be better, that yeah. we need to be guided by the better angels of our nature, if you will, from Lincoln. But your thoughts, uh, I mean, I just wanted to cite that for you, sure. because that's what I, I see when I, when I hear you and when I, when I watch you. Well, you know, um, the Tocqueville you mentioned came to this country back in the 1830s. Once again, 1830s. He came here from France to study our penal system. And while he was here, the Tocqueville said that he saw a certain magic about this country, and he set out to try to find out what that was all about. He went all around, legislative halls, uh, uh, churches, and uh, synagogues, temples, and mosques, trying to find out what this country is all about. Now, there are two things that uh, often get credited to Tocqueville. And, and, and what is this? And I cannot find that the Tocqueville ever really said this, but a, a lot of people, including Bill Clinton, used to love to give the Tocqueville credit for this. A lot of people did. That uh, the Tocqueville said that America is great because its people are good. And the people of America ever cease to be good, America will cease to be great. That is a true statement. And I really believe that. And I don't know because historians really argue about whether or not the Tocqueville ever said that. I don't know if he did or not. But let me tell you what I know he did say. Mm -hmm. And it's written in his two volume work called Democracy in America. He wrote this America is not great because it is more enlightened than any other nation, but rather because it has always been able to repair its faults. That was written in the 1830s. Yes. And guess what? We didn't get rid of slavery. Right. Until 1863 uh, and 1865 down in Texas, as we just learned. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <last> <laughs> Almost uh, 18 to, to 20 years later, but that was to repair a fault. The Supreme Court in 1954 with Brown v. Board of Education 
was to repair a fault. Yes. And so the Congress in 1964 and in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and 1968 with the Fair Housing Law, 1972 repaired, uh, uh, putting all these things into the public sector. These were done to repair faults, living out the greatness that the Tocqueville saw in us. And so what I try to say to people all the time, and that's what the Congressional Black Caucus is all about, is trying to make sure we live out the true meaning yes. uh, of all of those things. And one of the things I was trying to do, and I know uh, maybe campaign a little bit right here uh, for an idea, but you know, all of us have a responsibility to mold us into one nation under God, yes. indivisible. And one of those things is for us to have one national anthem. And that's why I have been proposing of late that we make lift every voice and sing our national hymn for two reasons. The song is not an anthem, it's a hymn. So it should not be called the Negro National Anthem. It is a hymn. Let's make it the national hymn. And that's why I propose legislation to do that because that would be our contribution, one of our contributions to making this one nation under God indivisible, the liberty and justice for all. Yes, thank you, sir. Let me, um, we mentioned Juneteenth. I think uh, it would be appropriate to acknowledge the action of the Congress uh, just last week in approving and then uh, President Biden signing uh, along with the, uh, with the vice president who signed <laughs> a copy as well, but yeah. signing the, the measure into law. From your vantage point, the significance of Juneteenth and maybe how that applies to another very important holiday that we're about to celebrate uh, the 4th of July. Uh, you're thinking about the two of them and how they uh, connect or uh, again, move us toward the more perfect union? Well, a lot of things about Juneteenth. You know, uh, uh, Juneteenth, as I said, uh, when I talked about 1865. Yes. January 1, 1863, Emancipation Proclamation comes into effect. The word doesn't get to Texas for whatever reason. More than two, two years. and a half years later. Yeah, yeah. The failure to communicate. Every time I talk, about Juneteenth, I talk about the failure to communicate. In fact, on the day that we passed the bill, uh, I went to the floor to speak. I had a, a, a written text uh, of what I was going to read on the floor, but I got there about three or four minutes early and I listened to some of the debate coming from the other side. Mm -hmm. And they were debating whether or not the word independence ought to be in this. They, were, they didn't like that, they said. Uh, and they were all for the bill, but they didn't want us using that word. Well, uh, I said to them, why not communicate to us? If that's a problem you had, uh, the bill is floating around out here. Uh, it's been out there for years. Uh, the Senate finally passed John Cornyn, uh, along with Ed Markley, uh, mm -hmm. put it up in the Senate side. Uh, nobody ever communicated you had a problem with the word independence, uh, but it goes back to what's going on today. Communication is how we learn how to live with each other. When you communicate to me what your feelings are, then I can respond to those feelings. That's how I stayed married to the same woman for 58 years. Communicate. Let me know what your feelings are. Let me share with you what my feelings are. And then let's sit down and see, can we talk through this? That's what we've got to learn to do. And that's what led to Juneteenth, the failure to communicate. Now, when I was speaking, you may recall, I referenced the fact mm -hmm. that we were all in a building that was built by slaves. Yes. I also referenced the fact that we all sat under the statute of Lady Liberty. Yes. And the fact that Labor Liberty, uh, Lady Liberty, when that uh, statute was out there on the, on the cap of the grounds. They couldn't get it on top of the building. 
Uh, it, it was a guy, Philip Reed, a slave, brought up to Washington from Charleston, South Carolina, who showed them how to get that statue on top of the building. He had been uh, denied the ability to learn to read and write. Could not, was not educated, but he knew geometry. Mm -hmm. And he showed them how to get that statue up there. Now tell me, what is wrong with teaching young girls and boys those stories? Yes, the capital was built by slaves, but now 57 uh, African-Americans on the house side uh, and three, I mean 57 Congressional Black Caucus members. Yes. But there are three members of Congress that are not members of the caucus, two in the House and one over in the Senate. So that's 60 people of color, descendants of slaves, now serving in the House and Senate. When, when that building was built, their yes. forebears did it with slave labor. We ought to teach people that. There's nothing wrong with knowing that. And there's a lot to be learned from that. Exactly. I mean, it would be a way, frankly, to celebrate Absolutely. Um, how far America has come. Let me ask, um, and, and, and um, uh, Mr. Whip, I, you know, we're running a little tight on time, but there are a few things that I really want to get in. And, you know, there are a number of great Americans who have um, chaired the Congressional Black Caucus. We've mentioned some of them, and I'm thinking about uh, Congressman John Lewis and Shirley Chisholm, uh, Congressman Rangel, uh, Charlie Rangel, Congressman John Conyers and others. Uh, and clearly they were in the arena fighting the battle. Uh, you mentioned uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, a few minutes ago and he always talked about being in the arena. Yeah. And those whose um, brows are um, you know, sweated with, with blood and sweat and who engage and how the credit belongs to the person who's the, in the arena. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are battles being fought in this arena today. The, the, the Voting Rights Act, uh, civil rights uh, work, uh, human rights, all of that work continues. Uh, as you think about the role of the Congressional Black Caucus in taking on those battles, what can you say to citizens listening to you about our responsibility to do more as citizens than to vote? I mean, that's important, but citizenship requires so much more. What are some of your thoughts um, in that regard about how the citizens of America can be helpful to the caucus in doing its work? I'm so glad that you read and you really mentioned that because look, the best example I know of that is 2008, the election of Barack Obama. He was elected president. And I talked to a lot of people who thought that they had done their job by voting for him. Uh, two years later, his support staff, members of Congress, we lost the House. We lost it. Over 50, I think 56 votes, I believe, uh, we lost. Uh, and the next thing you knew, um, he couldn't get his program through. So we have to do more than vote. We have to get engaged in the process. And we have to keep people informed about what it is uh, that is taking place in these communities all around the country. Uh, we members of Congress uh, come home, uh, I do every weekend. Uh, we get elected uh, every two years if you're in the House, every six years in the Senate. But everybody's got to be involved in this process and bring your um, expertise uh, to uh, the attention of those of us who serve. Everybody's got a role to play. Mm -hmm. I was talking to earlier uh, to Bob Moses and a few people. I talk about the time I ended up staying in jail for three uh, days and three nights because. <laughs> Uh, the person who's supposed to be out there raising the bail money got himself locked up with us. 
Oh my. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, we were uh, the ones that go to jail. He was supposed to be raising the bail. Uh, so when the roles got confused, we stayed in jail too long. And that's what happens. <laughs> so let's not confuse our roles. You know, I'm a member of Congress. You are one of Washington's finest, one of the nation's finest lawyers. Uh, the stuff that you do, I can't do. But I can come to you and share with you what it is that I know and how I think we can uh, get things done. And if we have that kind of communication, uh, we can solve our problems. This stuff of one upsmanship yeah. uh, that seems to be taking hold in the country, uh, sound bites ruling the world. No, mm -hmm. we need to sit down and think through things. And not just whether or not you make a headline uh, tomorrow morning, but whether or not we make some headway by tomorrow evening. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Webb. Um, you know, uh, uh, when you made the comment about the person getting locked up with you, I'm reminded that um, uh, Ambassador Young, by the way, a former member of the Congressional Black Caucus, Absolutely. Uh, before going on to becoming um, the head of the uh, our UN ambassador, uh, during the Carter administration, he used to say that during the years when he was working with Dr. King, that part of his job was to stay out of jail so that he could help raise the money for those who were in uh, jail. So point well taken. But let me uh, ask about this, um, this message of the caucus uh, that uh, is being promoted now, our power, our message. And I think you were getting uh, to some of that. I mean, we've got members of the caucus heading uh, any number of full committees, subcommittees, but uh, the our power, our message seems to be a way of trying to hone all of those responsibilities in a way uh, as to be most effective. But your thoughts on, on, on that particular uh, question? Yeah, you know, think about it. For the first time in the history of the country, we have an African-American, David Scott, down there in Georgia, heading the Agriculture Committee. That yeah. is a huge deal. For the first time in the history of the country, an African-American, Gregory Meek, up there in New York, heading the Foreign Affairs Committee. That is huge error. Now, uh, not to mention Bobby Scott, Education and Labor. Uh, not to mention Maxine Waters. Chair yeah, Financial yeah. Services, my classmate, Ada Bernice Johnson, Chair in Space and Technology. These are full committees. J uh, Bennett Thompson, heading uh, Homeland Security. That's six, right? Yes, yes. Now, when they get to the subcommittees, we're going to get up to around 30 uh, subcommittees. Now, that is where the power is. But the message has to be coordinated. And that's what uh, uh, Joyce Bader, uh, she coined uh, this new uh, motto of ours, our power, uh, our message. And we have to message the power. You know, there's no need to sit there just to be there. Mm -hmm. If people have to know that you're there and people have to know that you can, they can come to you and help you be successful. We can't be successful alone. You know, I don't chair a, a committee, uh, but I interact with all the committee chairs uh, on a daily basis. I've just been on the, the phone with um, David Scott today uh, and with other, uh, with the Secretary of Agriculture, looking at what we can do to coordinate what's going on with the black farmers and why how we can navigate through these lawsuits of people who are trying to deny the aid that the Biden administration want to get to black farmers because of the discrimination that they suffer. You got people saying, we don't care about that discrimination. We didn't do it. And we are not doing anything about it. But that's not the way you build a more perfect union. You build a more perfect union by making sure that you strengthen every weak link that exists in the chain. And if you know where the weak links are, you've got to strengthen those weak links so that we can keep a strong nation going forward. 
So that's what our message is uh, now, our power, our message is all about. Using the authority given us by the voters, uh, that is the voters in our congressional district, as well as the voters in our caucus. They made these people uh, chairs of these committees and message that. Communicate with one another in such a way uh, that we can understand uh, one another as well as understand the constituents uh, that we are all about serving. Well, thank you. Uh, Congressman Clyburn, let me just maybe ask one last, um, one last question. Um, and it's a question that's, uh, that's personal to you. Um, and I thought about it a minute ago when you mentioned, uh, you mentioned how long uh, you had been married and you, know, you referenced Emily. And uh, I know that um, in one of the most significant moments during the last election, uh, when um, many were doubting what the outcome might be, uh, and uh, the current president was not looking too strong, right? I mean, if we're just telling it like it is, it's not like he wasn't on message, a message that he was able to sustain throughout the election, which is really quite significant and masterful. But he just needed a voice. He needed a special kind of help. And uh, you were uh, in a position to offer that. Uh, would you say a little bit about how you thought about your role in that regard and how you came to express your support in the way you came to express it. Well, I'm glad you mentioned in the way I came to express it. A lot of people uh, asked me about, uh, about that. I, I always knew that I was going to vote for Joe Biden. No question about that. Um, but it was Emily. Uh, by the way, the 24th of June, it been 60 years for us. It's my uh, uh, anniversary day. Um, she said to me on the night of my fish fry, which was um, uh, what the June, I believe, 19, uh, 2019. Um, the fish fry was such a huge success. We had over 7,000 people there. Uh, Joe Biden and uh, and 19 other people running for president uh, were all there. Uh, and that night after the fish fry, Emily did not come because she was losing that battle with, uh, with diabetes. And so I sat down with her that night when I got home and I said to her, I said, you know, uh, this is the biggest fish fry we ever had. And we've got the biggest number of presidential candidates uh, that we've ever had to choose from. And some of them were very good friends of ours. And she said to me, I don't care how many people are running. I don't care how many, uh, many are close friends of ours. If we want to win, we'd better find a way to nominate Joe Biden. She said that to me. And that stayed on my mind. Uh, and uh, fast forward to the weekend before uh, the debate down in Charleston. Uh, which would have been the weekend before uh, the South Carolina presidential primary. Yeah. Uh, I ran into another lady who I did not know, uh, who beckoned me over to her uh, at a funeral service. There I was to attend the funeral of my longtime uh, accountant. Uh, and this lady, beckoning me over. I went over. And she asked me to lean down. I want to ask you a question. And if you don't want anybody here to answer, just whisper it in my ear. And she asked me, who are you voting for in this primary? And I leaned down and I whispered to her, I'm going to vote for Joe Biden. She snapped her head back and she had this look on her face and she said to me, I needed to hear that 
and this community needs to hear from you. And that's when I made up my mind how I was going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, by this time, uh, Emily was no longer with us. Uh, she had passed away the previous September. Uh, and I talked about her as I made that endorsement. And if you recall, uh, I said at the time, my good friend and my wife's great friend, uh, she loves yeah. you. Yeah. No, I do remember that. And um, Congressman, we just want to thank you for all that you have done over the years. Uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, express uh, the, um, the thanks of um, uh, President Clinton and, um, and our First Lady then, uh, Hillary Clinton. You were very close to uh, our administration as well. And Mike Espy, I want to mention him because he was a okay. member of the caucus and came into the, the cabinet, Absolutely. Uh, was a great member. But you have been... Um, a person who's always looked beyond party labels, even though you're a strong Democrat. Uh, but you've always looked to find the best in everyone with whom you've had the privilege to serve. And we believe that that just represents uh, the character of the caucus as well. And we just thank you for this time that you've spent with us to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the caucus, to talk about those early members uh, and to talk about those who yet serve. Uh, we very much appreciate your service. We're looking forward to uh, hearing more from uh, Chairwoman uh, Beatty. And um, we just wish you Godspeed as you uh, continue to serve with distinction and vision and vigilance. And we- well, uh, thank you very much. We thank Thanks you. Thanks for your friendship. And thanks for all that you do, not just for us in the Congressional Black Caucus, but for what you mean to this country as a whole. A lot of people may not know uh, your tremendous influence in this area of infrastructure that we're getting ready uh, to delve into, but you are among the best. Well, thank you, sir. And now thank I'd you. like to turn things over to um, uh, Patrick Madden. He's our executive director. Uh, Patrick. Uh, please close us out. Thank you, Secretary Slater, and what an amazing conversation. I really want to thank, of course, our speakers and Governor Blanchard for helping us with this program tonight. We really appreciate all of you who have joined us, especially our members, corporate supporters, and donors. If you'd like to become a member of the foundation, you can join us today by visiting our website, archivesfoundation.org. And July 4th is right around the corner. The National Archives and the Foundation are hosting a day of terrific programming online for our national audience and some on-site activities if you live in the DC area for families at the National Archives building. Visit archivesjuly4.org to learn all about our programming that day. Whether it's Black History merchandise or your patriotic gear for July 4th, visit the best museum shop in Washington, DC. You can visit in the museum now that we're open to the public or go online to nationalarchivesstore.org and we'll ship it right to you. So be sure to follow us online, uh, join, sign up for our email, social media. We wanna make sure you know what we're doing and what's coming up. The National Archives is our nation's memory. What is past is prologue. So until next time, on behalf of the National Archives Foundation, thank you for joining us today. <laughs>